Have you ever been hungry? Really, really hungry. So hungry that you thought you'd die if you didn't get something to eat. Have you ever been in a place where you literally didn't know when your next meal would come or where it would come from? Have you ever experienced the horror of seeing people and animals die for the lack of food and water? This is a reality for people in many parts of the world. The UN has declared Somalia and three other countries, Northern Nigeria, South Sudan, and Yemen, as experiencing famine. The causes of famine are driven by political strife, including the Boko Haram insurgency, conflicts between farmers and herders, extreme weather conditions, especially flooding, and a dearth of agricultural infrastructure from years of little to no investment. A famine declaration means that at least 20% of people in an area face extreme food shortages and large numbers of people are dying from hunger. The Presbyterian Disaster Assistance is working alongside partner agencies to bring relief and I'd be happy to share more information with you after worship. As most of you know, we'll be receiving the one great hour sharing offering today. For most of us, we are unlikely to see such a great need directly. Local needs, which we do see, we do support. Remember, this month it's peanut butter. These images, though, struck me forcefully as I considered our text this week, for with God's mercy, all was possible. Without it, all seemed hopeless. Still, we need to think of our own lives and how we see our resources. When we see crowds and we're really, really hungry, do we reject them or do we accept them maybe hoping for more, or maybe even saying something is better than nothing. And that could be what we're hearing in our lessons today. We could hear it in our lesson from Genesis, with Joseph sold into slavery, but now he's the second most powerful man in Egypt, and his brothers have come begging for food, begging for resources in the face of famine. Remember all that's happened to Joseph. He was sold by them into slavery. Then, while in slavery, he was falsely accused of a crime. And he was imprisoned. And after being promised to be remembered by royal officials, after he interprets their dreams, he slept for two more years in the same prison. But God was faithful. And when Pharaoh needed a dream interpreted, now well, his cupbearer, that royal official who had previously forgotten Joseph, remembered his promise and reveals Joseph's gift of interpretation. You know the rest of the story. Joseph did interpret the dream and was made second in authority only to Pharaoh. And they prepared for the coming famine. So he was put in charge and as the years passed, the famine grew and expanded and affected the surrounding countries. Even Joseph's family. Now, they were looking for crumbs, and they didn't realize the man they were looking at 
was the very man they had initially wanted to kill. The one in power is the one who had dreamed of being in power. Imagine their fear when they realized that this powerful man who literally had the power of life and death and not just directing them to be killed, but by merely refusing them food, he was the man who was their younger brother, who they had condemned to a life of slavery. I wonder if they recognized that the crumbs they could get would be very, very welcome compared to their lives. Yet that isn't what Joseph had in mind. He revealed how God used what they had intended for evil to be used for good, bring many to safety out of starvation. Likewise, our psalm speaks of extravagant mercies seen by the overflowing of anointing oil. How mercy is just poured out. If we move on to our passage in Romans, we see the evidence of God's mercy. And in Paul's writings, his assurance, his confidence that God has not rejected Israel and instead has grafted on Christians, bringing salvation to all nations, not just to the Jewish people alone. Phrased a bit differently than Paul, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16 Paul considers the question if his people were being rejected by God and comes to the conclusion that absolutely not. What they were called was to be a blessing and God always, always is faithful. But then we come to our gospel reading and wow! Something sounds very, very wrong in this Canaanite woman's encounter with Jesus. It's disturbing, and I think it was meant to be. There are a lot of different commentaries that have a lot of different interpretations on what we're hearing, but I would like us to consider it a different way. When is enough enough. When is enough the exact thing most needed? No doubt the account is disturbing, but I believe what we have here is a question of who is in, who is out, and why this account was included in Matthew's Gospel. As I said, there are a lot of theories and possibilities out there, but I think at least part of it was a question of who was to be welcomed into the community of believers. It would be very easy for a small group to say, we barely have enough to survive. The promise of Messiah is to us and our people, Jewish followers of Messiah. Why should we, or how should we, or how can we welcome Gentiles, pagans, those from outside our faith traditions? How can we have the resources? How will we have the ability to teach and to welcome. They won't understand us. They won't understand who we are. Maybe they would even be seen as contaminating the believers. Sounds a bit crazy, doesn't it? We know the Great Commission. 
But this happened well before the resurrection. Today's passage begins with a question of what defiles a person. Is it something you eat? Or is it even basic hygiene of washing your hands? And yes, please continue to wash your hands. Jesus says, no, it's what comes out of your mouth because what comes out of your mouth comes out of your heart. He says, for out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. Metaphorically speaking, food doesn't affect one's heart values. That passes through. One's heart values are shown by how we live. And no, I'm not telling you to ignore your doctor's instructions on nutrition. As Jesus goes north into the area of Tyre and Sidon, he is entering an area definitely hostile to the Jewish people. As one commentary puts it, it was not the sort of place you went alone if you were Jewish. Of course, Jesus wasn't alone. He was with his disciples. But it wasn't the sort of place you expected to get a nice, warm welcome. It was the sort of place that you watched very carefully what was happening around you. And into this, we have a woman shouting at them. But she's not shouting things like, yet you go home. But she is shouting, help my daughter. Jesus doesn't respond at all. What is the disciples' response? They want her sent away. Where have we heard that before? Something about loaves and fishes, perhaps? They want her sent away, not to get food, but so she'll stop bothering them. Then Jesus says something very disturbing. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. What? Why? The woman is not deterred. And by the way, she's using very honorable terms for Jesus. She's acknowledging who he is, and she kneels down as a supplicant. And believe me, culturally, just like shouting out her request, this would not be the norm. But here she is, kneeling on behalf of her daughter. Think about her desperation. Is there ever a time that we would not do everything possible if we had a child or a family member who was gravely ill or seriously afflicted by something? Would we try to do everything in our power to restore them, to reach out from whatever source might be available? Yet what does Jesus do? He compares her to a dog. Okay, in the Greek, it's a little dog. Say what? I'm sorry, being called a dog, or even a puppy, is not a compliment, then or now. But I wonder, 
why he said it. Because I think Jesus knew exactly what he was going to do. Were his disciples nodding at his words? It was a common uh, comment to refer to Gentiles as dogs. What gave her the right to make demands, to interrupt them? Was he allowing his disciples to have a rather radical attitude adjustment? The woman was sharp, and she wasn't insulted, or at least the insult could be overlooked in her daughter's need. Instead, she gives a quick and respectful response to point out that even dogs or puppies are allowed to eat the crumbs under their master's table. She knows somehow that even the crumbs were more than enough for her daughter. I wonder if Jesus rather than having an off day, as some commentaries speculate, was instead forcing his disciples to examine the question of what do we do when outsiders come when we don't have enough for ourselves? Do we just send them away? Or do we welcome them and share the little that we have because at God's table, there's more than enough to feed all who approach. I recognize this is a different interpretation of this lesson. However, when we consider the accounts of the mustard seed and the leaven, both oh so small, but examples of the kingdom of God, then the loaves and the fish, also tiny, but richly filling the 5,000 men, not counting the women and children, with baskets upon baskets left over. The woman was willing to accept the crumbs as long as the crumbs released her daughter. Jesus again changed the expectations of the world. The Jewish community, while important, was not the only community he was called to serve. His faith would spread even among non-believers as he traveled to Sidon, likely spread by a grateful mother. Hope was being extended the Jewish nation was being a blessing to the world. The word was being spread. The crumbs were bringing new life. Are you willing to feed on the richly filling crumbs of heaven? And are you willing to share them with everyone you meet? Amen.